Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real privilege to be able to be with you here at the Katy Church. And um, as was mentioned a little bit earlier, I work with Amazing Facts. Amazing Facts is a media ministry located in Sacramento, California. And by way of an introduction for our uh, study this morning, uh, let me give you a little bit of history with reference to Amazing Facts. Amazing Facts began about 45 years ago with a gentleman by the name of Joe Cruz. And he had a radio program. And at the start of each program, he would always begin with a little amazing fact. And he'd draw a lesson from that amazing fact and then present a Bible lesson. So keeping with the same tradition, Amazing Facts is a radio program, as was mentioned, Bible Answers Live, and we always begin the program with a little amazing fact. So let me begin my sermon today with an amazing fact. Back in 1874, the members of the Little Methodist Church in Swan Quarter, North Carolina, decided that it was time for them to build their own building. So they began to look around town and they found the perfect piece of land on which they could build their church. It was owned by a Mr. Sam Sadler. So they approached Sam and they asked him if they could buy his property to build their church. But when Sam found out that it was a church they wanted to buy his land, he flatly refused. You see, he felt that such a beautiful piece of land located centrally in the little community needed to be sold to some other important uh, resident of the community. Maybe it needed to be sold to a person who was going to build a bank on that property or maybe something related to the city. So he refused to sell it to the church. Even after the members raised their offer, he still refused to sell it. Well, finally, they accepted a gift of some land just outside of town and they went about building themselves a little wooden church building. Well, two years later, the night of the dedication of their new church, a storm began to brew. And it rained and rained and rained. And the little creek that ran through town quickly grew to a raging water river, and it flooded its banks, and the water kept rising. Well, the residents of Swan Quarter awoke to a very interesting sight the following morning. You see, as the flood waters arose, it lifted the little wooden church off its foundation. And as if guided by an unseen hand, the church began to make its way towards town, like Noah's Ark. <laughs> the residents looked out of their windows in the morning, and they saw the little wooden church floating down Main Street. Some good Samaritans tried to tie off the church, but the church just broke the ropes and kept moving. It went down Main Street, and then it stopped, and it made a sharp right turn. It then went for three blocks and stopped and made a sharp left turn. It then floated down that street, which currently is called Church Street, and it came to rest right next to an open piece of land. It then moved itself into the center of the property, where it remains today. Yes, the very land that Sam Sadler refused to sell to the congregation. Well, in the morning, with trembling hands, Sam Sadler brought the deed of the property to the past of the church, and he said, I think God wants you to build on my property. <laughs> so the church became known as the Providence Methodist Church of Swan Quarter, the church moved by the hand of God. Well, eventually that church was replaced with a brick building. Here's a picture of the brick building. But if ever you're in Swan Quarter, be sure to stop out front and you can read the plaque and it'll tell you the history of the church that was moved by the hand of God. Well, the reason I share that with you is because I believe there is another church that has been raised up and moved by the hand of God. You see, I believe God established the Advent movement to do a special work in these final moments of earth's history. A movement to proclaim a message that will prepare people to meet God in peace. You see, Jesus is coming. And there is a message that needs to be given to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. It's a message that will prepare people to meet a holy God. God has raised up this church. He has raised up this movement to do a special work in the final moments of earth's history. 
Our scripture reading today comes from Matthew chapter 16. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea of Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I am? Now, why did Jesus ask his disciples that question? Didn't he know what the people thought of him? Well, yes, he did. Jesus asked the question because he wanted the disciples to think about it. So he said to them, what are the people saying about me? Who do they think I am? And the disciples responded. And they said, some say that you are John the Baptist. Well, by this time, John the Baptist had been beheaded by Herod. And people looked at the work that Jesus was doing, and they said, this is John the Baptist resurrected from the dead. Others said, no, he's not John the Baptist, but he is Elias or Elijah. And the reason they said Jesus was Elijah is because of the prophecy that you find in the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, that says, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to the fathers. And so people looked at Jesus and the work that he was doing, and they said, this is Elijah that has come down from heaven. And still some of the other people said, no, no, he's not Elijah. He is Jeremiah. Jeremiah resurrected from the dead. And some said, no, no, he's not Jeremiah. He's just one of the prophets. He's just a prophet. And then he said unto them, but whom say he that I am. In other words, Jesus said, I know what the people are thinking about me, but who do you think I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Now it's kind of interesting here that Peter says Jesus is the Christ. You see, to the Jew, Jesus was not necessarily the Christ. The Christ was the center of the hopes of the Jewish nation. Every good Jewish mother would look into the face of a newborn son and secretly hope that he would be the Christ, the Messiah, the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament prophecies, the one who would come and liberate Israel from their enemies, the one who would build up the nation, the one who would rule on the throne of David. Every good Israelite was hoping for the coming of the Christ, Christ the deliverer, the one who would come set the people free. And Simon Peter said, you are the Christ. You are the deliverer. You are the one who has come to set us free. Jesus then responded. And Jesus answered and said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. In other words, for a person to come to a correct understanding of who Jesus is, it's more than something that we accept intellectually. It's something that we have to accept in our hearts as well. You see, it's not just believing that, yes, 2,000 years ago, Jesus came. In order for us to really know Jesus as our Christ, as our deliverer, we have to surrender our hearts and our lives to him. Then it is that Jesus can set us free. Then it is that he can give us power over the enemy. Then it is that Jesus can work his will within us, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Peter. This is not something that you heard from somebody else, but this is the moving of the Holy Spirit upon your heart. It's the Holy Spirit that awakens within us our need of Jesus. And it is the Holy Spirit that reveals to us that, yes, Jesus can set us free. He is our deliverer. He is our Christ. Then Jesus goes on, and I sound to thee, speaking to Peter, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now I hope we all understand that Peter is not the foundation upon which the church is built. The word Peter there in the Greek means pebble or a stone. But the declaration that Jesus, or rather that Peter had just made, that Jesus is the Christ, that's the foundation upon which the church is built. You see, Peter never accepted or never acknowledged himself to be the foundation of the church. To the contrary, in the book of Acts, you read how that Peter speaks of Christ as being the rock, being the foundation, being the cornerstone in the books that Peter wrote. 
Jesus is the rock upon which the church is built. And the fact that Jesus is the Christ, that is our foundation. That is our strength. Now notice the prediction that Jesus made though. He says, and upon this rock I will build my church. Then he says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now what is the it in the verse? It is the church. You see, because Jesus is the Christ and the church is built upon Christ, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Now, often we think of the devil being on the outside and we're on the inside of the church. And the devil is pounding against the gates of the church and we're sort of bunkering down and just holding on for dear life saying, Lord, please don't let the devil bust down the gates of the church. But that's not what Jesus had in mind when he said these words. Notice, it's not the devil breaking down the gates of the church, but it's the church breaking down the gates of the devil. You see that? It's not the church trembling at the presence of the devil, but it's the devil trembling at the presence of the church because the people believe that Jesus is the Christ. It's not the church retreating, but it's the church moving forward. It's the church breaking into the very strongholds of the enemy and setting sin's captives free because Jesus is the Christ. So the devil gets together with his demons and he says, Oh man, what are we going to do? That Katie church believes Jesus is the Christ. And they believe that God has given them power to enter into our territory and to proclaim the gospel. And we're going to lose our citizens. They're going to change sides. They're going to become citizens of the kingdom of heaven. What are we going to do? Because those people believe Jesus is the Christ. You see, that's what Jesus had in mind. When he said to his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel. This was the church advancing against the enemy, breaking down the gates of hell and setting sin's captives free. Does that make sense? We have this statement. Before we get to that, let me tell you a little story. During the Second World War, there were a group of soldiers, well-trained and well-equipped. And then on a dark night, they were loaded in planes and they were flown across the English Channel and they jumped out of these planes with parachutes. They were called the paratroopers. And they landed in the midst of enemy territory and then they gathered together in smaller bands and their mission was this. They were to advance against the German front line, but from the rears, and they were to attack and weaken the front line so that the Allied assault could proceed. So the Allied forces could come breaking through. Now the paratroopers realized that their only hope of rescue was the successful accomplishment of their mission. They had nowhere to retreat, nowhere to go. They had to press forward with the mission until it was successful. And you know, friends, in many way, ways, I think of the church as God's paratroopers. Here we are, placed in the midst of enemy territory, and God has gathered us together in little bands, in churches, and He has said, you advance against the stronghold of the enemy, you be faithful to the mission until King Jesus comes breaking through to take us home. Thus we need to work together, we need to press together. We need to work in sharing the gospel with those around us, preparing the way for Jesus to come, to come and take us home. In Testimonies, Volume 5, we have this statement. The church is to conduct an aggressive warfare to make conquest for Christ, to rescue souls from the power of the enemy. God and holy angels are engaged in this warfare. Let us please Him who has called us to be what? Soldiers, soldiers in the Lord's army. You see, in an army, every soldier has something to do. And so it is in the church. Not all of us can get up and preach an evangelistic series, but there is something for every single one of us to do, right? We can all get involved in the work of taking the gospel to the world, to those in our community. We can all play a part in building up the kingdom of God because we are called to be soldiers in the Lord's army. Now based upon a church's understanding of this very important principle that Jesus is the Christ, 
it results in three types of church mentalities. And the first is what I call the castle mentality. So think of a castle, high, strong walls, big iron gates. And the purpose of a castle is to keep people out and to preserve the status quo, the king and the queen. So in the castle mentality church, the church is very inward focused. We're more concerned about ourselves than the accomplishment of the mission that Jesus has called us to do. In the castle mentality church, preservation of the status quo becomes paramount. We just want to keep doing things the way we have always done things. You know, friends, nothing challenges the status quo like evangelism. It's like having a brand, brand new baby in the home. You know, when you have a new child, things change. You don't get as much sleep as you'd normally get. There might be a mess that you have to clean up from time to time. And when the church gets involved in evangelism, things change. You've got brand new people coming to your church. It takes prayer and effort. You have to reach out to them. You have to minister to them. It takes patience. You see, a castle mentality church doesn't like to do evangelism because it means that they're going to have to put forth additional effort. One of our evangelists was doing a meeting in a church that I won't name. But during the meeting, he happened to hear two church members talking. And the one said to the other, I can't wait for these evangelistic meetings to be over so all these people can go and we can have our church back. <laughs> what kind of attitude is that? That is the castle mentality, right? Preservation of the status quo. This leads to institutionalism. What do we mean by institutionalism? Institutionalism happens when we forget why we were originally established and we begin to think that our prime purpose is to prosper ourselves. We forget why we were originally established and begin to think that our prime purpose is to preserve and prosper ourselves. You see friends, God did not raise up the Seventh-day Adventist church for Adventists. You realize that, right? God raised up the Seventh-day Adventist church for the world. God did not raise up the nation of Israel for the Jews. He raised up Israel for the world. To prepare the world for the first coming of Christ. But Israel thought that God had blessed them because somehow they were better than everybody else. We can fall into the same trap today. God did not raise up the Adventist church for us. He raised it up for the world. And so when we as a church get together and we begin to discuss our plans and our programs and how we're going to spend our resources, do we spend our time discussing what we want or do we spend our time focusing on what He would want? What's His mission for us? How are we to use the resources that He's given us? Is it furthering God's mission or is it just simply something that's going to make us comfortable? Are you with me? That's the castle mentality church. Tradition overrides principle. Now, traditions are good if they are based upon solid biblical principles. But if the tra tradition becomes more important than the principle upon which it's based, then things get out of balance. Let me give you an illustration. Following the Babylonian captivity, the Jews finally realized that the reason they kept going into captivity was because of their violation of God's law. So after the Babylonian captivity, they came back and they said, we need to make sure that we keep the Ten Commandments. And so they began to add a whole lot of traditions to try and safeguard the principle of the law. But as time progressed, the tradition became more important than the principle upon which it was based. And so one day Jesus and his disciples were walking in the field on the Sabbath, and the disciples were hungry. So they picked some of the grain and they rubbed off the chaff, and they ate it, and the Pharisees accused the disciples of breaking the Sabbath. They hadn't broken the Sabbath. They might have violated the tradition, but they were faithful to the principle. Does that make sense? So it is in our church. Yes, tradition is good, but it needs to be based upon solid biblical principles. You know, I was raised up, and I was told growing up in an Adventist home, 
that we as Adventists don't go to the movie theaters. And the reason given for that was because people smoke there, it's not a good environment, and if Jesus comes while you're at the movie theater, you're going to be lost. Those are good reasons. But as you get older, you begin to realize why is it now that we don't go to the movie theater, but we will take the very same movies in the movie theater and we'll watch it at home on our big screen TV. <laughs> and now they don't allow you to smoke in the movie theater, so what's the difference? Are you with me? So the young people are saying, this doesn't make sense. Listen, friends, if it's not good enough for us to watch at the movie theater, it's definitely not good enough for us to bring into our home. Does that make sense? So we need to be faithful to the principle. By the way, I'm not advocating going to movie theaters, not in the least. Matter of fact, the opposite. I don't think that's where a Christian should be. But likewise, I don't think we as Christians should be watching the same things that have been watched in the movie theaters. Does that make sense? We need to be faithful to the principle. Faithful to the principle. All right, Castle Mentality Church kills evangelism. As I said, nothing challenges status quo like evangelism. An example of a castle mentality church, the Jewish leaders at the time of Jesus. Now that's one extreme. I don't think God wants us to be a castle church. There is another extreme, and I call that the resort mentality. So here, think of a beautiful resort there on the beach, white sandy beach, palm trees, soft music playing, everything to please and entertain. In the resort mentality, the focus is on drawing large crowds of people. The more people that you can have coming to your church, the more successful you are as a church. And as a result, there is a de-emphasis of distinctive Adventist truths. The very message that God has asked us to take to the world, the three angels' messages, that will prepare people for the coming of Jesus, no, we don't really want to proclaim that because that might upset somebody and then they won't come and then our attendance goes down and then we're not a successful church. You understand what I'm saying? So we neglect preaching the very message God has called us to preach. In the resort mentality, it leads to entertainment instead of worship. Now let me explain. I don't believe that worship is something that you just turn on Sabbath morning when you come to church. It's not like a, a switch. But really what happens here, Sabbath morning at church, is really an outflowing of what Jesus has done in your heart and life during the week. You see, worship begins on your knees beside your bed. You're pouring out your heart to Jesus. And when we get together Sabbath morning, it's just the outflowing of what Jesus has done in our hearts and our lives throughout the week. That's why you can have two people in church singing the very same hymn, and one person is bored to death, and the other person has tears running down their cheeks, what makes the difference? It's the heart. Does that make sense? It's the heart. It's the outflowing of what is in the inside. In the resort mentality, there is a compromising of truth for the sake of popularity. Uh, truth is important. We need unity, but we want unity on the truths of God's Word. We want to be faithful to Jesus. In the resort mentality, there is a tolerating of sin for the sake of unity. It doesn't matter if he's a, a crooked businessman or if he's mean to his wife and kids. As long as he comes to church and puts something in the offering plate, nobody's going to say anything, right? Unity under all circumstances. The resort mentality church can function under the banner to please at any cost. Whatever's going to make the people happy, that's what we're going to give them. Whatever they want to hear, that's what we're going to tell them. I don't think God wants us to be a castle mentality, nor does I think He wants us to be a resort mentality. There is a better way. I call it the seek and save mentality church. In the seek and save mentality church, the church exists to save the lost and reveal God's character. Both are equally important. You can't save the lost without revealing the love of Jesus, right? They go together. So in the seek and save mentality church, everything we do as a church is governed by that principle. How does this reveal Christ's character and how does this work for the enlargement of His kingdom? Every decision that the board makes with reference to how they're going to spend the money is, how does this reveal Christ's character? 
And how does this work towards the enlargement of his kingdom? Does that make sense? That becomes the governing principle of the church. How do we reveal Jesus? How do we build up his kingdom? In the seek and save mentality church, evangelism then becomes the focus of the church. We are building up God's kingdom. And everything that we as a church does is geared towards evangelism, sharing the gospel, sharing the three angels' messages with people, bringing people to a saving knowledge of the truth and into a meaningful relationship with Christ. The seek and save mentality, we need to have a clear understanding of our message and our mission. We need to know why we are here and what it is God has called us to do. What is our message? What is the mission? that he has given us. In the seek and save mentality church, every member becomes involved in soul winning. There is something for all of us to do. I mentioned earlier that the church is like an army. And you know, in the army you have soldiers. But not every soldier is on the front line engaging the enemy. There are soldiers further back who are providing supplies. There are still others who are orchestrating the battle from a distance, but everybody has something to do. So it is in the church. Everybody can get involved in soul winning in some capacity, somehow. In the seek and save mentality church, the focus is on conversions and not simply baptisms. Now, we want to have baptisms connected with conversions, but a baptism might be something that happens once or maybe twice in a person's life. But conversion is really something that happens every day. The Apostle Paul says, I die, what is it? Daily. There needs to be an ongoing conversion, an ongoing dying to self, an ongoing allowing of the Holy Spirit to work His will within us. Now the question is sometimes asked, well, how do I know if genuine conversion is taking place in my life? How do I know if those that I'm working with are experiencing genuine conversion? There are three ways to know if genuine conversion is taking place. Number one, Am I revealing the fruit of the Spirit in my life? Am I becoming more and more like Jesus? Is there love in my heart? Do I have patience? Now we understand that sanctification is the work of a lifetime, right? We might not be where we want to be, but by God's grace we shouldn't be where we started. There needs to be progress. There needs to be growth every day. Point number two, how do we know if conversion is taking place? There should be a growing desire to share Jesus with somebody else. If we have tasted the goodness of Christ and we've experienced His grace and His love, we want to tell somebody about it. We want to share it. Point number three, if genuine conversion is taking place in our life, we will be, by God's grace, gaining victory over sin. For Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you shall be what? free indeed. We understand sanctification is the work of a lifetime, but there should be growth. Jesus has come to set us free. We need to tell people there's good news. The power of Jesus can give us victory over sin. Amen? He can set us free. So when we are working in evangelism, the question we're asking ourselves is, is genuine conversion taking place? Is there manifest the fruit of the Spirit in the lives of believers? Is there a growth towards holiness? Is there a growing desire to share Jesus with others? Not only do we want people's names written on the church books, we want their name in the Lamb's book, right? Amen. We want their names written in heaven. Another characteristic of the seek and save mentality church, victory in Jesus and His righteousness. Jesus came to give us victory over sin. Training and equipping lay members for service is important because we all have a part to play in this great work of taking the gospel to the world. The seek and save mentality church functions under the banner to save at any cost. Whatever time, whatever resources, whatever effort is required for me to reach out to somebody else, that's what I'm willing to do because we see the value of a soul. We look at people through the eyes of Jesus. We say, oh Lord, please, just, just give me my neighbor. Lord, please give me my family member. Lord, please give me the person that I work with. We have a burden for souls, you see. Lord, whatever it takes, please use me to reach somebody else with the gospel. Share with them good news. You see, Jesus left the glories of heaven and he came to the sin-polluted planet to come and seek and save the lost. That was his mission. 
That needs to be our mission. There is no greater joy that we can ever have in life than the joy of bringing other people to Jesus. Let me close with a little story. I was about 10 years of age. It was a Sabbath afternoon, and my parents had told us, I was there, my two cousins were visiting, my parents had told us you need to be real quiet because mom and dad are going to do lay activities. And you know, that we're going to get some rest. And so there we were at home. We couldn't make a lot of noise. We couldn't be outside going wild on our bicycles like we'd normally do. So we sat around wondering what to do. And somebody said, hey, why don't we be missionaries? We thought, oh, that's a good idea. We can be missionaries. My cousins were about my age, around 10, 11 years of age. Now, growing up in Africa, where I grew up, if you're going to be a missionary, you're going to go to India, right? I mean, if you're going to be a missionary and you grow up in North America, well, you're going to go to Africa or something, but we're already there. We want to be missionary. We want to go to India. We want to go tell people about Jesus. Oh, we can't go to India. That's too far. Somebody said, hey, we, we can be missionaries right here. We said, oh, that's a good idea. We thought about it. What could we do? Well, listen, we can go to the neighbors. And we can tell the neighbors something about Jesus. What should we tell them? We thought about it a little longer, and somebody said, Hey, let's sing a song. And we can sing a song. What song should we sing? Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Yeah, yeah, we can sing that song. And then let's read a little verse of Scripture. Well, that was easy. John 3.16. That's what we're going to read. And so there we were, dressed in our little Sabbath suits with our Bibles under our arms. We opened up the back door, and we walked outside. Later on, my mother said she heard the back door close. She peeked through the curtains, and she saw the three musketeers marching down the driveway. She said, oh, Lord, be with those boys. There they go. And off we went. We went to the neighbor. We knocked on the door, and the person opened up the door. And we said, hello, we're here to tell you about Jesus. We didn't wait for response. We just started singing our little song. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. After we sang the little song, we'd open up the Bible. Didn't matter where we opened, could be Isaiah. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We read our little verse, we close the Bible, we say, thank you so much for listening, and we go to the next house. It was going pretty good. We're going from house to house to house. And, well, there was one house, not too far from where we were living, and there were cars parked out front on the street. There were cars down the driveway. There were cars even parked on the grass. Something big was happening there. And we looked at each other, we thought, well, should we go? Yeah, yeah, let's go. So we marched up to the door and we knocked and the lady of the house opened the door and we said, hello ma'am, we're here to tell you about Jesus. She did something that nobody else had done. She said, oh, well come inside. <laughs> kind of looked at each other, all right, nobody invited us in before and so we followed her and she <laughs> led us down the hallway and she turned into the living room and the living room was packed with people. The television was on, there was a big sporting event. And everybody was watching. Now in South Africa, the big game there is rugby. It's like American football, but without the helmets. And that was a really big deal. And so everybody's sitting watching this big rugby match on television. And the lady who brought us in the house, she said, these boys are here to tell us about Jesus. And of course, nobody even looked at us. They all just kept watching the television. Well, my cousin Ashley, he was the brave one. He walked over and he turned the TV off. <laughs> That caught everybody's attention. And when we saw the look on their face, we realized we need to make this quick. And so there we stood in front of the TV, and we sang our little song just as fast as we could. And we opened up the Bible, and we said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And we finished the verse, and we said, Well, thank you so much for listening. And we turned the TV back on. And we turned, and we marched down the hallway. And we opened the front door, and we headed down the stairs. But just then, I heard a voice. It was the lady that had invited us in. She said, wait a minute, boys, come back here. And we turned around and we marched up the steps and there we stood looking up into her face. And I remember there were tears in her eyes. And she said, boys, thank you so much for coming to my house to tell me about Jesus. And right there and then I said to myself, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I want to tell people about Jesus because there is no greater joy that we can ever have in life than the joy of sharing Jesus with somebody else. And friends, that's what the church is all about. 
It's about sharing Jesus with people. It's about telling Jesus, telling people that Jesus is coming back and he's coming soon. It's about sharing good news that our Jesus can save, that he can save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. And all power is given unto him. There is no trial, no difficulty, no circumstance so big, so difficult that Jesus cannot see us through. Now we have good news, friends, good news to share with the world. And that good news is Jesus, and that Jesus is coming soon. Amen. Friends, my prayer for this church, and I know there's some of you here who are maybe from some, some neighboring churches, my prayer for your church is, Lord, please make us a seek and save mentality people. Give us the love of Jesus for souls. Give us the eyes of Jesus so we can see opportunities where we can encourage somebody else, where we can speak a word to bring hope, where we can share Jesus with those around us. Friends, that's my desire. What about you? Amen. Is that your desire? Praise God. At this time, we will sing our closing hymn. I believe it's I'll Go Where You Want Me To Go. I'd like to invite our song leaders to come forward. Yes. Sure. Amen. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, that's fine too. Absolutely. and we join hands would you do that just stand and join hands and forgive me while I barge into what you're doing and Keith if you know this song you can play it with me all right and let's just bow our heads for this prayer in this very room there's quite enough love for one like me and in this very room there's quite enough joy for one like me and there's quite enough hope and quite enough power to chase away any gloom for Jesus Lord Jesus is in this very room and in this very room there's quite enough love for all of us and in this very room there's quite enough joy for all of us and there's quite enough hope and quite enough power to chase away any gloom for Jesus Lord Jesus is in this very room and in this very room there's quite enough love for all the world and in this very room there's quite enough joy for all the world and there's quite enough hope and quite enough power to chase away any gloom for Jesus 
Lord Jesus is in this very I'll be seated. Just as a quick reminder, we have potluck. Please do not leave. We have food prepared for you. And at 2.30, we're going to have another session with Pastor Ross. So don't miss this. I encourage you to stay behind. We're going to go right ahead into potluck. Then right after that at 2.30, we'll proceed. Thank you so much.